Hello and welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, your host. And, you know, the United States Environmental Protection Agency has put out a national recycling policy draft document uh, that is currently being discussed in Washington and across the country uh, as the basis for how both government and private uh, companies, as well as NGOs, are going to collaborate to improve the recycling rate in the United States over the next decade. And we are very fortunate to have Adina Renee Adler, who's the Vice President of Advocacy at the Institute for Scrap Recycling Industries, to talk to us about uh, ISRI's feelings about which way the recycling policy should go. Let me just, before I bring her on, uh, outline what the recycling industry looks like in the United States. We have a, a, a recycling recovery rate uh, that's somewhere between 28% and 33 to 34%, depending on who's counting. And it accounts for more than 750,000 jobs, $36.6 billion a year in wages, and tax revenues of about $6.7 billion a year. So this is a massive undertaking in our country that currently collects and exports uh, or processes about $110 billion a year worth of materials. The new EPA plan, uh, when enacted, is going to shape a lot of how we continue to invest. And I wanted to bring Adina on to talk about what we need to improve and what uh, opportunities there are for citizens to participate in this discussion as well. Adina, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much, Mitch. I'm glad to be here. Well, uh, thank you for joining us. And ISRI, you know, does important work on behalf of the uh, recycling industry, as well as recyclers helping to articulate you know, clear guidelines about what to do. First, let me just ask you, what is your general take on the EPA's national recycling policy? And, and what are they trying to do from your perspective? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Um, we're First of all, I just want to say we're very grateful to the U.S. EPA for taking leadership on developing a national strategy because we do we do believe in and we appreciate that they're trying to help us enhance the residential recycling system. Um, we've seen a, a copy, of course, of the draft strategy, which is out for public uh, view and comment. Um, and it focuses on what we at ISRI do believe to be the core components that will help us all to achieve success. So that includes addressing contamination um, on the materials that come into our recycling facilities, as well as uh, being processed uh, through and what comes out on the other side. Uh, ensuring future resiliency through innovation and infrastructure development uh, within uh, the sector, and as well as, and just as critical, is promoting market demand for recyclable materials uh, that come out of the recycling system to be put back into the manufacture of new products, as well as promoting uh, market and consumer demand for goods that are recyclable. Now, one of the things you mentioned, contamination. So let's talk a little about that first, because it is the mixing up of both recyclable and non-recyclable stuff, uh, whether it's in the blue bin or in the uh, collection process, that results in uh, what is known as contamination. And that prevents a successful recycling of the material. And amongst other things, that costs the United States uh, the opportunity to export materials to China a couple of years ago, which has radically changed things. How do you feel the policy undertakes to improve the recyclability or the recycling information that's available? Because that, for our readers, is always a challenge. They don't know what goes in the bin. And, and do you feel like the EPA is thinking about a, a wide enough consumer education process to, to start to change that? I do believe so, um, because the intent of the strategy generally is to lead to activities that strengthen um, our system, and that can only come through um, enhancement of uh, public participation in in any form, whether it's just putting more products within their recycling bin, as well as uh, any activities that they can take within their households to improve the quality of, of those materials. And so we agree that transparency is absolutely critical and, and we are eager for more opportunities to enhance education and awareness, which 
I think will be addressed in some way within the strategy, but we're also seeing it through uh, legislation um, that has been proposed on Capitol Hill. Um, There's one in particular called the Recycle Act Mm -hmm. um, that is pending before Congress right now. And it specifically would earmark funding for the US EPA uh, to undertake an education and awareness uh, campaign um, around the country. They actually did something like that, uh, they being the EPA, uh, early in the pandemic. Um, there was a, a series of uh, public service announcements that went out and just said, hey, you know, help continue to recycle, continue to put your cardboard boxes into the bin and keep, you know, certain other things out of the bin so we can make sure that we get these critical managed back, uh, these critical materials back into the manufacturing supply chain. So overall, how would you say the policy proposal stacks up to what the industry needs to do in order to improve recyclability, recycling rates, and and getting more material through to the next generation of product? Yeah, well, I admit I'm still reviewing it, um, but at least in terms of the main themes uh, within the policy, which was you know, as I already mentioned, it's contamination issues, it's resiliency, and it, it's it's market demand. Um, those are definitely on track with what we believe are the main contours of of a strategy towards achieving success in and you know in a in a uh, an enhanced uh, recycling system. So, you, you did publish a series of, of comments, uh, and we'll share a link to that in the in the article that goes with our podcast. Uh, one of the things that EPA called out was kind of a focus on on job growth, and you said that might not be the right or primary metric for assessing this policy success. Why is that? So, our understanding is that EPA's intent is, in, which is a good intent, is to help drive job creation, not sure. just within the recycling industry, but also in related and indirect industries, such as the manufacturer that the manufacturing sector that relies on recyclables as critical feedstock. The idea is that if you improve or enhance recycling um, and get more materials available to manufacturing, then you might see more uh, production capacity to make goods made from recycled content, which of course you need uh, people to to be employed by that. Um, but in terms of the comments, the re- one of the reasons we didn't feel that this was a primary metric for assessing the success of of this strategy to enhance recycling is because innovation and systemic efficiency in recycling can come in many forms. Mm-hmm as through new sorting technologies or even optimizing business management practices. These different approaches will, of course, require human resources, but the number of jobs needed to support these approaches could vary widely. Um, There already has been significant investments in domestic recycling capacity, including, uh, for example, on on, uh, processing paper and uh, collected paper and plastic, These are, of course, positive developments, irrespective of the fact that they did create jobs, but they're they're just generally positive because they are improvements to the system. And so we don't want to judge the success of a recycling strategy because, one, uh, you might have two different uh, municipalities that make similar decisions, but one may require just five more employees, but another may require 15 more employees. That doesn't necessarily make one more successful than the other just because of the number of jobs created. So that's why we made that comment. So in fact, if we were to judge our agriculture system by the number of people that employs, it would look like a miserable failure over the last hundred years when it went from 90% of people working in food supply to 3%. But in fact, we made massive progress. It's an excellent point. The other, the other area that um, stands out to me, and it's also uh, you gesture at it in your comments, is the, the, the continued reliance on the garbage collection system uh, and whether or not that needs to be re- reconceptualized based on the fact that we have so much more technology and we may be able to do more with niche sorting by, by moving things that sorting to the edge. Do you think that we need a more distributed collection infrastructure than we have today? 
You know, recycling is a market-driven business, um, and we believe there could be a range of solutions um, that can uh, contribute to a, a, an enhanced recycling system, uh, both for increased citizen participation, enhancing the process itself, increasing the use of recycled materials and manufacturing. I think all of these um, can make improvements uh, to the recycling rates. So whether or not it's tied to, to garbage collection or a more distributed infrastructure, I think it it sort of depends. It depends on localities. Uh, it depends on needs. It depends on the markets themselves or where the manufacturers are located. Um, so, you know, we would we would not prescribe one path just because there could be multiple paths that could still arrive you to that same end goal. And now, so the, another area where, and you, you also commented on this, how do you feel the, the investment and in, in even potentially subsidies for improved domestic materials processing uh, should be weighted in terms of uh, what we previously have done with so much of our recyclables, which is export them? What does ISRI think we should be doing in terms of, of really ramping up the U.S. domestic processing capabilities? You know, it's it's a combination of things. Um, again, it's um, it's so so a couple of different things. Um, successful rec- recycling still it depends on that attention to quality. So you can uh, we can work with communities to understand their role in, in improving that quality. Um, and that would be it, it could be on the part of the federal government, the part of the state and local governments. It could even be on the part of us recyclers on brands, all the stakeholders to fully to work together and fully understand, you know, what we could all be doing to enhance recycling. Um, we we also do not have good federal definitions of recycling, which it, it, it impacts how um how recycling and solid waste, trash collection, all of these different things are addressed and regulated by governments. Um, Recycling is essential to the manufacturing supply chain, full stop. We are producing and processing materials that feed into the manufacture of new goods. We're not solid waste processors, but we recognize that there are facilities that sometimes handle both solid waste as well as recycling. And so we do uh, we do need and we try to work with the EPA and with the Congress to come up with opportunities where we can set clear definitions so that we can understand then how we oversee these operations. And then, you know, there's always talk about funding and, right. and if, if there is an opportunity of funding, where does that go? And we're very circumspect about um, certain proposals that seek to pour a lot of money into collection and uh, public recycling infrastructure projects um, because it, you know you can you can pour in a lot of money and do a lot of increased sorting, but if you don't have the market demand for those materials. Unfortunately, you'll have well-sorted trash. It'll just go to landfill. That is to say, if we don't have manufacturers that want and need recycled commodities to put back into the making of new products, then then why would there be a recycling system? Who, who would we be recycling for? And, and then you do have recycler, recycling companies that are both public and privately owned. And so pitting one segment against another does not necessarily make for a functioning market system and a functioning system to be able to feed into that manufacturing demand. So long story short, there's, there's, it's an, it's another response to say there's a combination of, of ways that we can address these ideas. Well, and, and, and point well taken because, of course, the prices for recycled commodities have gyrated wildly, particularly during COVID. Uh, and, we're, we're, and we also see right now a, a market disconnect around aluminum. Uh, aluminum manufacturers can't get enough of the recycled stuff. And because of COVID and the interruptions in the system, there's not enough aluminum to recycle. Now, do you, uh, we've also seen just. Uh, as commentary, a lot of uh, investment in the last six months in 
uh, acquisition of recycled materials. Nestle, for instance, is putting about $100 million against uh, buying more recycled plastic. Do you feel like at this point, recyclers are seeing increased interest in the materials that they produce from manufacturers? Is, or is that an area where the EPA can get involved and create more incentives for reuse of recycled materials? Well, I think it's both. I think we are both seeing, and, and you you touched on plastic. So, you know, there is a difference between plastics and metals demand. Um, metals, uh, you know, you're right that aluminum manufacturers cannot get enough of, of the material they need. And the pandemic actually had a significant impact. But that's a that's a manufacturing segment that has had strong demand for recycled content for decades. Decades, yes, exactly. For a very long time, steel also, you know, you have a 70, 70, 70% uh, uh, capture rate, you know, for, for steel scrap as well, going back into steel mills. So that's something that's been there for, I would say, even centuries, very, very long time. Whereas the demand for recycled plastic is a relatively newer uh, when compared to metals, a much newer um, sort of demand stream. And, and it is very positive to see these brands um, wanting to incorporate more recycled content into the products that they make. It's very positive and it, it has, um, you know, helped spur uh, some of the investments that we are seeing in recycling capacity to be able to meet uh, some of that demand. But I do think that more can be done not just by EPA, but even if it's the federal government, for example, you know, there's been, there had been talk before the pandemic about a major uh, uh, infrastructure bill. Right. And not only would, you know, we're very supportive of that because we depend so heavily on um, our transport network to get materials from from households to recycling facilities and then from recycling facilities to the manufacturers. And so we need, you know, well-built roads, bridges, you know, a well-functioning railroad and marine system to make sure we're moving materials around. But also they were talking about building new bridges and building new roads and building, you know, new Rail spurs, all sorts of things, yeah. Yeah, all sorts of things. And you can use recycled content in all of that. <laughs> so that also would have spurred demand uh, for for materials that come out of recycling processes. So so that's you know, that's where the, the federal government can always have whether it's through project development or it could be through tax incentives. Um, we also uh, we do have a bonus depreciation allowance for tax allowance for um, the heavy equipment uh, that is used in recycling facilities. Um, that is very helpful right now, but that's a tax benefit that is not permanent. We could also see the federal government make that permanent, and that would also spur investment within recycling as well, because you can uh, also offset the cost of those uh, of that equipment. So I think, again, there's always the range of, of ideas that can help uh, spur uh, investment in the, in the sector. How do you see uh, various states' efforts? You know, California recently passed uh, a bill that uh, introduced aggressive plastic recycling goals, and uh, New Jersey is in the process of debating many of the same issues. Does the EPA plan take into full account the need for states to take the lead sometimes and and follow definitions, for instance, of what is recyclable that might be provided by the feds in the future? Uh, we do see the opportunity and hope for the opportunity in the future for the EPA to take that leadership role. We've been uh, advocating for that for years, um, that they issue guidance uh, that clarifies uh, definitions of solid waste, definitions of recycling, um, that then the states could use and implement uh, within their jurisdictions. Um, and so we're, we're hopeful that someday the EPA would take that up and, and provide that guidance to the states, because you're right, there is a whole range of state policy that is being developed and passed and implemented that, you know, some of it, it's it, a lot of it, most of it, or actually, I would even say almost all of it is well intentioned. Um, we we support some, we don't support others, mostly because uh, 
we are a for-profit industry. It is a business. Recycling is a business. And um, we just want to make sure that these legislative proposals don't interfere in the market dynamics that create supply and demand for recycled content that then spurs innovation and investment. Um, so some of them do that and some of them don't. And, and so that's what we're looking for. So to the extent that EPA can provide that guidance uh, could be a, a tremendously helpful. Yeah, in a way that to me, it's like they need to define the rules of the game because as we were talking about before, recycling is a participatory sport. If people don't participate in it, if we don't put things, the right things in the bin, or we mix the wrong things together and send them through at a, a, a transfer station, it actually undercuts the the entire system. As you look at the EPA's proposal, does it do too little or not or too much to increase the the definitions that we need in order to all know that, you know, this is a recyclable object, regardless of which community I live in. And 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 also we can use that definition to create greater transparency to say, are we really capturing all of this PET plastic or all of this aluminum? Are are we really are we aggressive enough about the fact that good definitions are widely needed across the United States? You know, I'm not 100 percent sure only because I'm still making my way through the draft strategy. I, I see it as a, a point that needs to be addressed mm-hmm. in the strategy. But what I haven't read yet was I haven't gotten to the point where they say specifically how they're going to do that. Um, so I'm not hundred percent sure yet. Um, it is my understanding is, is that it, it does require rulemaking and this strategy may not yet, like I said, I'm still reading through it, but I, but I don't know if the strategy is going to get to a point where it says, yes, we will undertake rulemaking to clarify definitions. Um, my guess is it may not which means that we would hope for uh, that aggressive step um, mm-hmm. in that direction. And, it, and if it's not in the strategy, then we'll continue to pursue other opportunities where we can try to have that happen. But uh, still, it's still unclear to me just because I, I'm still making my way through it. Well, and, and recognizing that you're still, it's a process of understanding something as comprehensive as a national strategy. Um, what, improvements does ISRI see that, that you would like to see put in place? Um, I think we just want to make sure that we have uh, everything clearly stated. But, uh, again, it's the definitions issue. It's understanding even the definition of contamination. What do we mean by that? You made a comment at the top about y- you could have contamination that renders a product unrecyclable and then you can have a, and I'm using my air quotes here, a contamination that doesn't necessarily render the product unrecyclable, but it just doesn't belong. Right. So what does that mean? What does contamination mean? And, and so then we can understand better what the goals are for decreasing contamination and, and how we can arrive at that. There's also, you know, how do we spur market demand? Um, I don't know... You know, market demand for us is always driven by market forces. So it's hard to say that we need EPA to stimulate market demand through some policy or regulation when that actually is technically an interference in the market. So when I'm when I'm not supportive of a recycled content mandate in in a state bill, you know, to mandate a certain amount of plastic be incorporated in new plastic packaging, you know, it it is a good policy on its on its on its face, but at the same time it's an interference in the market. So I'm not sure I would necessarily want EPA to also interfere to, you know, do more to stimulate that demand. So it's a you, you kind of have to balance that a little bit. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that this strategy can you know, really dive into some active, you know, regulatory, political, legislative policies that might be required to really achieve success in a short amount of time. But at the same time, we don't have a strategy, a national strategy. And so this is a, this is a first ever, at least in recent times, a, a major endeavor um, on the federal government to, to undertake this. And for that, we applaud, you know, the, the effort. 
So it, it makes complete sense to me that, that, you know, in this uniquely American way we do things, that we're, we're really trying to create a voluntary system. How do my readers get involved in this process? What do you recommend they do? Should they read this policy and write to their Congress rep- uh, congressperson about the uh, what they feel? Should they be submitting comments to the EPA? Or is it something that really needs to happen in committee rooms at this point? No, I think it's all of the above, honestly. The EPA is developing the strategy because it has been requested by the Congress that they do that. So writing to your member of Congress uh, absolutely can still have that effect of of um, then the congressperson making a recommendation or suggestion uh, into the EPA as they develop the strategy. Um, but the strategy is open for full public comment. It's on their website. And we have until December 4th to provide uh, comments on it. And comments can come in the form of being, you know, very specific about what's in the strategy, all the different components, you know, you didn't cross your T's, anything like that. Or it can be at a high level saying, I'm a citizen and I just need to make sure that you take my interest in, into account and here's what that interest is, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think, I think there's always a t- lots of different ways. That's the beauty of our democracy is that anybody uh, can play a role in providing comments um, to this strategy. Also um, just to put a little uh, commercial in here, um, ISRI as well as the Solid Waste Association of North America are co-organizing a MRF summit on November 18th, 19th. It's an event that brings to all stakeholders together, which includes policymakers, to talk about all the unique issues within the residential recycling system. So that's even another opportunity where we can have folks come in and um, listen to what policymakers are busy with. We will have um, a senior official from EPA speak, who will probably be touching upon the recycling strategy. And um, everybody would be more than welcome to ask questions uh, of him or make suggestions of him uh, as, uh, as they develop it. So that's also another opportunity that can uh, be heard. Well, we'll we'll point to that uh, uh, in the article. So uh, the last question, the public comments uh, uh, period ends on December 4th. Uh, There's a national election on November 3rd. Could that change the trajectory of this policy? Because uh, the, the, the strategy is actually mandated by Congress to develop, um, I think it will still continue to be developed because you have non-political uh, uh, you know political appointees working on this, very hardworking um, uh, career staff that are working on this. I think the question will be how it's implemented and whether or not If it's the current administration, if they are reelected, or if there's a new administration that comes in, it'll depend on what they may focus or or how much attention they want to focus on recycling and how much they want to roll out the strategy itself. I think regardless of that, it's a, it's a, it's a just process wise, as I said, I, I don't know if EPA has ever done this before. And so I think just getting communities together to talk about, you know, how would you pursue a strategy to improve recycling? I think in it, in and of itself is going to be a great learning experience for all of us and could, in, and could still stimulate opportunities for us to try to pursue aspects of the strategy, even if we're not under some obligation to do so. Well, uh, Adina, thanks so much for uh, sharing your thoughts on the national recycling strategy. You're welcome. And I was so glad to, to, to be here with you all today. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, we'd love to have you back as this continues to evolve. Folks, uh, that was Adina Renee Adler. She is Vice President of Advocacy for the Institute for Scrap Recycling Industries. It's a Washington, D.C.-based industry research and advocacy group. Uh, you can check them out at isri.org, I-S-R-I dot O-R-G. The National Framework for Advancing the U.S. Recycling System from the EPA uh, will be uh, formulated uh, and uh, enacted over the course of the next couple of years, as we've heard. Uh, 
do get involved and take the time to check it out, we'll have links in the uh, article related to this podcast. And we encourage you all to participate in recycling generally, as well as shaping the future of our recycling. This is Earth 911 Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, and we're going to be back with another innovative interview soon. Everybody, stay safe, stay well, take care of the Earth. Have a good day.